Hello and welcome to Data Research Labs. This tutorial covers how to track test cycles or test runs in my test case manager. First up, a level set on test runs, also known as test cycles. So we're going to start with an open test case template here. And to open the test run log worksheet, you simply click test run log. This form is used at the end of every test run or test cycle after, you've done, after you're done executing all the test cases from the prior worksheet over here. You basically transfer these statistics over into here, and we'll see how that's done in a minute. So the test case values here come from here, but the test defects, defect counts, those are nowhere to be found in this particular document. These defect values you hand enter from whatever defect tracking system you use, and you track them here manually over time so that they roll up into the nice reports that we'll look at in a future video. There are a few key points here that need to be emphasized for in particular. You are manually entering all of these yellow values. We're going to see how to do that in a minute. And these values drive the report worksheet over here. It's all empty now, but as we enter values, this report gets populated and the trend gets established, etc. So these values are really important and you enter the test case status counts taken from the test worksheet over here and you enter the defects from whatever defect system that you have. So that is the four key takeaways. Next up, how to insert a new test run row from a single worksheet of test cases. There's a general process for entering test run or test cycle row data in and it goes something like this. First you enter some test run data information here. In the first row, I filled it out. Don't fill in the gray cells, only the yellow cells. These all came from the test case numbers here, and I transcribed them, placed them in here. If I go to look at the report, it's all blank. That's because it's looking at R2 right there. It goes to the maximum release. So actually, I'm going to go up and I'm going to delete R2. And then you can see that, in fact, the static snapshot has the actual values, five uh, passes, two qualified passes, one fail, one block. Notice that the trends, there's only one data point. You can't have a trend with one data point, so it all goes to zero. And I haven't entered defects yet, so that's blanked out. But the test run log is very important. Let's go ahead and finish that. So I went out to, say, my JIRA site and found that I have one showstopper defect that I found in this test run, one lower or to medium severity, it's not a showstopper, two issues that I deferred, and two that were fixed and closed, so six total issues. So now if I come over to the reports, yeah, I can't have a trend, but at least I can look at the snapshot of release number one and see what the status is. Next, we're going to enter row number two or run number two and put a bunch of metrics in. And there I've entered test run number two, same sprint, next day. Took a little bit longer for this test cycle, 1.2 hours. And I put in my test case counts and put in my defects. And now if I go to the report, I've moved on my snapshot to run number two. And I have the metrics there where I have a to-do count, a couple of test cases I didn't get to, one block, no fails anymore, three qualified passes, nine passes. And then my counts are starting to look better. And if I want to look at the trend, now I have two test runs or test cycles worth of data. And I can see, oh, my passes are trending in the right way. They're going up. My qualified passes staying about the same. My to-dos, maybe I'm getting a bit behind because I shouldn't have to-dos at the end of a test release, but I do. The uh, blocked stayed the same, and the red, the fails, went down to zero. So that's trending in the right direction. Over here in defects, yeah, those don't match, so my test data is bogus. <laughs> you would, well, that's a test case. These are defects. They're different things, so it's okay. So we have one open defect. We had more in the past. We had two on the prior run. The deferred stayed the same, and the closed is trending properly. It's increasing as we go along. And if we wanted to take this all the way out, well, actually, before I do that, we're going to look at what all these notes mean. So you're defaulted with two blank lines, and I could have done 10 blank lines, but I thought, eh, might as well explain. If, if I did 10 blank lines, then the report would look icky because you'd have two test runs, and you'd have eight empty spots on the chart for the trends, and that's just there. So 
the minimum you need for a trend is two points. So those two points are established. But if you need a third, a fourth, and a fifth, here's how you do it when you follow these instructions. And it's really important that you follow the instructions because if you don't, you'll mess up the formulas, the equations, the graphs, etc. So the proper way to do this is to highlight the last row, the whole row, control C to copy it, and then right click and insert the copied cells right over the top of the cell. So that pushed R2 down, but that's okay. We're going to leave the new R2 intact and we're going to call this one our R3. So this becomes our R3, and then I go change this to test run number three. And this one will be the 13th, let's say. And then I would go in and change all of these up to whatever they are. Let's say it's 1.1. And, and there's the rest of the data points for that row. And then we look at the report, and now we get three in our trend, which is nice. And of course, R3 automatically snaps. It basically figures out the maximum in this range and then uses that maximum. And so there's our R1, R2, R3, and so on. And you could get out to six, seven, eight releases, and then you get a nice trend of what's going on, and you can show if things are getting better or worse, et cetera. And there's other graphs, too. We'll go into those in, in, different, uh, in a different video. And just to reiterate it one more time, just so you can watch it, let's say we wanted to do an R4, we would highlight the row, Control C to copy, right click, insert copied cells, that pushes the R3 down, and then this one would become R4. And this one would, we'd change it to whatever we want to change. It doesn't have to be test run, it could be blah, 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 that's fine. And the date could stay the same, maybe you ran two builds on the same day, that's all fine. The execution time, maybe it went out to 2.2 hours, etc. cetera. Uh, and filled out the rest of the mock data. And now our report looks like this. It looks better. We can see that it's a little, the qualified passes, we have a whole bunch of those because we didn't retest stuff, and passes, but we don't have any fails. So the test cases all look good, no blocks. And then over here, sure, there's one open defect, but later we'll see how we can go look. Is it a showstopper open defect? No, it's not. It's a lower priority one. But that is how you follow these instructions to insert test cycles and then manually fill out all of the data. And I'm going to go off script here. Uh, you could completely forego all the test cases, use whatever test case system you have, and you could start, let's say you had test rail and all your tests in there and Jira and had all your, your defects in Jira. You could start with just this test run log and you could insert your metrics and use the combination of the test run log and the reports to manage your projects by. So that's another way you could use the template. You don't have to use this and fill out all the details here if you don't want to. Next up, how to insert a new test run row from multiple worksheets of test cases. So the previous section, test run log, is all fine and good when you have a single worksheet of test cases. But what do you do when you have a whole bunch of worksheets test case one with a section, test case two, test case three, and they all have their own 12 test cases, 0.1 hour, 17 test cases, 0.3 hours. Now you have all these metrics. You don't really want to go sum all these up across just to enter them into here. That's tedious. So that was why this was created in the larger template to save you time. This section up here, as you can see in the formula, goes to test case one, J5, test case one, J5. So it grabs the to do, and then it grabs the same thing, J5 from test case two, et cetera. So this section up here is always gonna have the current state. <clears throat> so right now, across all of these test cases, only one through five are populated, six, seven, eight aren't. Across all those test cases, there's zero to do, zero block, zero fail, two qualified pass, and two that are passed. Now let's go, let's go to test three and let's flip one of these to fail. Capital F, move off of it. Boom. Now I got a fail here, and it should be reflected instantly right there. And it is. And so these metrics are always up to date. And this is one of the reasons you shouldn't be deleting or inserting worksheets. If you do, 
you have to know to go modify what to modify across the sheet. So if it's it's safer just to leave these here, and if you're only using one through five worksheets, fine. Leave seven, six, seven, and eight blank. Uh, and then renaming the worksheets, eh, probably just leave it the same. But if you want to rename it, you can. Just make sure that the name of the worksheet automatically adjusts in Excel. Not sure if it does. Fine, let's go try it. Let's veer off and do that. Let's call it X1. Change it back in a minute. Go to the test run. And yep, Excel's smart enough to change it. So you can probably get away with changing those. But I don't know. If there's any place where Excel skips updating then you might run into a problem anyway this section the test results roll up copy source log is important because it uh, automatically tracks everything for you the date is just today and the execution time is a roll up just like the rest of them of the times right down here it sums those across all of these sheets so this is very handy and it enables you to come in here and do test Cycle number one, whatever, uh, early preview or something. I don't know what it is. Test cycle number two, uh, sprint three, whatever. I don't know what the details are. But here's the kicker. You come in here, highlight these rows, and they, they go straight down. You copy them. And as the instructions say here, you paste the values only. Do not just paste. If you paste, you're going to get all zeros and you're going to get the wrong colors and everything's going to be messed up because it's going to be using, it's going to be referencing the wrong cells. So undo. And instead, when I highlight and control C to copy, I'm going to come down here. I'm going to right click and I'm going to paste the values only. So that just simulates me hand typing them from up here. And that way it leaves all the formatting. It picks the right values. 1.2 is actually a sum across all of these. Oops. And uh, so always remember to follow the instructions here and paste the values only. And don't overwrite this. It's a formula. The defects, we have nothing. You're always going to be stuck going to your defect management system to key those in and enter them. So I'm going to go ahead and fill out the rest of this form and then go show you the report. It should be just the same as it was for a single sheet test case. And there are all the data fast forward filled out. We go look at the report and we have our trends and we have our metrics just like we did with the single test case tab. It, the, the test run results log and the report look the same. The only difference is this section right here, which saves you time so you don't have to manually go down here and go, uh, where is it, 9 plus 25, etc. That's all it's doing to save you that time. All the blue tips, they all are the same. Right click, highlight the whole row, copy the row, right click, insert the, uh, yeah, it's not there, I messed it up. Control C, and while the wire rope is going, then you get an insert copied cells. So anyway, all the rest is the same. The only difference is it's saving you the time and then you copy paste values only. Oh, and one note. Sure, I could have pretty easily put a button here and had some DBA code that automatically inserts a row and automatically copies these values and pastes them down, but I chose not to because if you are ever to change any of this stuff, then you have to get in and change the DBA. That wouldn't be good. And moreover, I don't want any security issues. I want a simple XLSX, not an XLSM. I don't want any macros or VBA code. It makes it easier for you to download it from SourceForge or from GitHub and not run into problems with your company firewall blocking it because there's code. If it's a codeless tool, you shouldn't have any problem pulling it down. And that's why there's no uh, code or automatic button to do the work for you. I don't think it's that. Once you get used to it, it's not a big deal. It's pretty quick. But who knows, maybe we'll revisit it in the future and add a button to do it automatically. And finally, how to enter the test run values. So here we are back at the simple template with one test cases worksheet and an empty test run log. And we're going to rehash some of the material that you've seen it in the last couple of minutes. We're going to walk through what each of these columns is and why they matter. So let's get started. It's important that you fill out all of the yellow columns but not the gray columns in each row. 
one row at a time. That way all the graphs, charts, and formulas work. So column number one here is the run number. And it starts at R1 in the, and R2 in the template. And you probably should delete R2 so that it doesn't mess up your report. And we could do R1 for run one, but I'm going to do C1 because maybe I like test cycle better. And maybe we want to call it, you can do whatever you want for a naming convention, but maybe we call it test cycle number one dash or colon or whatever. And I don't know, blah, 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 blah. We have some issue that we're focusing on. Uh, it could be sprint number one. It could be feature sets one and two. It could be user story, blah, blah, blah. I don't know, whatever makes sense for you in your particular situation. But I do want to emphasize that the test run description is a name that helps tell the story of how and what you tested and what issues you ran into. Management and others on the development team often believe testing is simple and linear. There are 60 test cases. They should take one in at a piece. So why aren't you done in 60 minutes? But testing is almost never one and done like that. It's done in phases, test cycles, and it incrementally grows and it waxes and wanes as the situation ebbs and flows. So by properly naming and organizing your test cycles or test runs, you can help educate your team on how and why there are multiple test runs. The scope grows as does your understanding and the available tests to run. So examples might be, like we talked about before, the Sprint 05, Release 23, Week 14, UAT for Project X, whatever. You're going to have a set of, you need to come up with a good naming convention to tell your story as you cycle through and do two, three, four, five test cycles. Gone are the days where you do one test cycle and it takes you a month and you spend three weeks writing a whole bunch of test cases up and then one week executing them all in a big bang. Those are gone. You need to be thinking about doing test cycles where in week one you get a early release from development. You might as well start writing what test cases you can and executing them and showing the progress and showing how out of all the available test cases you have this many done. And even if you don't know that there's going to be 100 in the end at week number four, you know that there's 10 that can be written now and eight can be executed. So you fill out a description that's meaningful and you fill out all of these metrics that are as meaningful as they can be and you cut a test cycle when you do a status report and say cycle number one, I'm at five days in out of a four week project and I've got this many test cases done and found this many bugs. And then by test cycle number two, three days later, six days in out of your four week project, you're gonna be able to show, start to show a trend and you're gonna be able to explain to people on your team, this is what's happening in the testing and then it'll make it much easier for them to understand, oh, I see, that's why it takes time to UAT or QA test, whatever the builds are that you're getting and in whatever state they're in. You're basically real time taking snapshots of here's where I'm at and here's what's happened to get me to this point. So it's real important to spend just a little bit of time to fill these few cells out once every couple days. If you think about it, that's not too much to ask. What is that? Uh, not counting for me. It's about a dozen cells or less that you're filling out. And you have most of these metrics from your defect tracking system or your test case details over here. And you just fill them out and they start to tell a story and you can explain what's going on from that story. So anyway, I got off tangent, but uh, the test run description is really important because it's going to summarize what's going on and, and help tell your story. The date field, Excel, control, semicolon. It'll put in the current date. So that's kind of a neat trick. You don't have to use that. You can go enter whatever you want, maybe two days in the future. There you go. So put in the date that this test cycle or test run is completed on. If it took you three days to get there, it's not worth having two columns, having to start date and an end date, no. Because you'll see a trend, you'll see this one was cut on the 13th, and then if there's a C2 test cycle two, and copy paste it and whatever, test cycle two, and it had blah, 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 and you'll start to see a trend, I'll do this, but uh, actually, uh, I'll make that one the 11th, and I'll make this one the 13th. And there we go, there's our trend. Well, if we finish test cycle one on the 11th, that means we spent two days to get to the 13th for test cycle two. So we just have one date. The uh, execution time, uh, get rid of this, It'll mess up. Anyway, the execution time and is uh, the total time that we pull from here. So we would just go enter that in, 0.9. The to-dos and the block and the fail and the queue pass and the pass, 
If we look at that order, it should match to do block fail. Yep, the order matches here. So 01125. So I can just come in here and I memorize them in order 01125. And then the defects, I would go out and determine how many showstoppers are there. Now, you could go to your Jura defect or whatever defect tracking system you're using, and you could look up all those counts, or I tend, we'll look at this later, down in the reports, I tend to track the defects here, and I just move them along. When there's a currently opened defect, I just put it in here and tell whatever its priority is. Is it a showstopper or not? I guess I would just put a yes or a no. Have my next one, no. So these are currently open defects. And then, anyway, I don't want to go, we're going to have a different presentation to go through this, but you could track your defects in here and look at your count and go, oh, I got two new since the last test cycle. And then close since the last test cycle, last report, et cetera. So however you want to track them, track your defects, and then put them in here. Now, most defect tracking systems are going to have four or more priorities. I didn't want to bother with that. I just wanted to focus on how many defects or showstoppers, whatever that means, whatever your your agreement is, maybe it's uh, high severity and critical severity, are both showstoppers fine. So if you have those two priorities and you have three defects that are in that bucket of critical severity and high severity, fine, put three there. And if you have two defects that are lower and medium, put your two there. And if you're deferring one, put your one there. And if you have 15 defects that are closed that you found, put your 15 there. And that's what these fields are all about. And they aren't gonna necessarily match up to the four or five, whatever, severities or priorities or visibilities or however you're classifying, quantifying your defects. But take and in your mind, figure out how to convert it, come up with some, not necessarily a formula, but a rule, business rule, rule of thumb that says, okay, our defects, we're gonna classify these defects as showstoppers and the rest are gonna be allowable in the open state. And you'll have some flavor of deferred and you'll have, you should only have one flavor of closed. The reason it's closed doesn't matter, the fact that it's closed does. And these columns are important because then the right half of the graph that we're gonna look at later is all about defects. And so you can have in your status report, test case L, uh, metrics and defect metrics. And that wraps up the test results, run log, test cycle log. It's a very important piece of this whole tool. Entering these values is really important to telling your story, communicating up and down and all across the project team what's going on and why. And it's often neglected in lots of teams I've been on. They'll have fancy defect tools, fancy test case tools, and no one's tracking what's going on by test cycle. They're just worried about spending the four weeks on the project or writing out and grinding through all the test cases and executing them. You're much better off served you and your project team by breaking that four weeks down into smaller chunks that you air quote arbitrarily define as test cycles whenever it's convenient whenever you want to kick off a status report call it the end of a test cycle it doesn't matter if you have a bunch of to do's it doesn't matter if you have a bunch of fails or blocks what matters is you're calling time taking a snapshot of what's going on and rolling up the numbers and then three or four days later you're doing the same thing and the fact that it's called a test cycle or test run doesn't really matter. It's just going to show that since the last time you took a snapshot and the current time you took a snapshot, here's what happened. And you can tell if things are getting better or worse. It's really important to do that. And that's why this is not a very pretty table, but it's super important because if you're properly managing your project, you can be taking these tap snapshots and uh, showing whether your progress is getting better or worse and that feeds these reports, which we'll look at in a subsequent video. Thank you for watching, and please, if you found this video helpful, click like and subscribe. Also, check out our other videos and related playlists in the boxes to the right.